I don't know who needs to hear this, but Jesus was not crucified on a Gucci cross. He didn't have on a crown of Versace thorns or Nike shoes on his feet when the nails pierced through. There was nothing bougie about Calvary. That old ruggedy wooden cross wasn't even befitting to hold the carpenter's son, but there our God hung, held on by his love for us, by his love for all. It wasn't a red carpet affair for your favorite celebs. Matter of fact, the only paparazzi was an angry mob as a crowd of witnesses. Once upon a time, I thought the crucifixion was like the Grammys. An award show only for a self-righteous few. But the Bible didn't mention an ovation. Only wrongful accusation, hate speech, and booze from fools as the King of Glory came through. But boy, did Jesus make a runaway out of Golgotha. Adjusted that burden of a cross, you would think he was like bad over his shoulders. I heard that he stated that when Jesus said it is finished, that was a fashion statement. Even in suffering, the sovereignty of his majesty could not be hid. But make no mistakes. Jesus felt every nail, felt every whiplash, every rib crack. It was for you that he braced the pain. Humiliated and stripped, his robes were confiscated like a game of Monopoly. They threw dice. Pierced, blood and water flowed from his side. Permit me to say that the drip is eternal. To date, we are healed by his stripes. I guess all I'm saying is, Jesus, stuff you die. Literally, I mean, he prays the cross for you and I. So do not let the devil have the last laugh because Jesus made a joke of death. Showed up at the gates of hell, was like, knock, knock, guess who's here? Shut down hell's party, set captivity captive. Who else raises the dead? Even in death is the audacity for me. But the story doesn't end there. He showed up on the third day like, I'm good and you are too. One with the Father, my blood makes you brand new. So what did I prove you need that God loves you? I do not know what your past is, but trust me, Jah is past it. Do not bottle in your shame. God calls you by his name. No capping. So when the serpent comes to the ring, hissing, whispering, deceitful accusations, speaking in pastoral tongues, this is clapback season. Declare boldly, my sins are forgiven. I do not know who needs to hear this, but Jesus was not crucified on the Gucci cross. It doesn't matter your age, gender, race, or net worth, only that you have been made holy. Our word today comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses number 1 through verse number 6. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. A risen Savior. Yes, we worship a risen Savior. All other religious founders are either in the grave or in the tomb, but our God, death could not contain him, we could not hold him. We worship him because he lives. And because he lives, we also can face whatever we face. There's some people who may not believe that Jesus resurrected, and that's okay. You may not believe in the God that we serve, that's all right. We're not here to judge anyone. What we believe is because it's what's in our heart. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit allows you to, re to understand who Jesus really is. Apart from that, you'll never know. We're not here as a church or as believers to try to convince anyone to accept or receive Jesus. It's not our mission to try and convince someone that they should be a Christian. 
Our mission is to go therefore to the whole world, make disciples, as Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that Jesus commanded us. That's our mission. You know, if a person is, is not hungry, even the best food will not satisfy them. You know, my mother used to make the best bread, that cornbread, not that jiffy stuff that we have when you get you by from scratch. The kind of bread that you say she put a foot in it. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, that was good cornbread. But even the best bread will not make a person eat because it's not bread that makes a person hunger. It's hunger that makes a person eat. If you're not hungry, then you're not ready to receive, even with Jesus. If you're not ready to receive him, even the best, the best that he can give for you, you'll never receive it because you're never ready to receive him. Back to that bread. If, if a person's not hungry, they'll look at the bread and say, well, what kind of bread is it? And what is it made out of? And is it fresh? And they have all these questions about it because they're not really hungry. But if you give it to a person who's hungry, I've never seen a person who was really hungry ask questions. They don't have the questions that you have when you're satisfied. If you really are hungry, you're grateful that someone thought enough about you to bring you a piece of bread. And Jesus said in scripture, he says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. John 6 and 35. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who receives and believes in me shall never thirst. If a person is not hungry, nothing will satisfy. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You have to hunger for it. Some things that don't come to us and because we're not having enough hunger for it. It's like, do you want it bad enough? There's a saying that when you want it so bad, you can taste it. That means it's already creating an appetite in you for whatever you're wanting for. You have to have an intense desire for it. Some things don't come to you just because you would like to have it. It becomes because you have a craving for it. If there's something that you ever desire right now, let's say if you want a new car or, or something specific that you wanted, and you start creating a craving, a desire for it, the first thing you'll notice is you start seeing it. I had a desire for a particular car a long time ago. We had a certain car that I wanted. I took a picture of that car and put it up on my wall. Once I started having this desire for that, they were everywhere. I started seeing them everywhere. And what is that? That's the vision that God gives you. When first thing that God gives you, he gives you a vision before he gives you the provision. But the vision doesn't come to you. The vision comes from you. Whatever you desire, create a vision for that. Create a hunger for it. Create a thirst for it. The one who hungers and thirsts shall be filled. But if you just kind of have an attitude, well, if I get it, fine. If I don't get it, fine. You can't create a vision from that. You have to have an intense desire for it. And that vision that we had for that car, we started seeing it everywhere. And within less than a year, we had that very same car. And we paid cash for that car. Because God don't get into debt. God don't believe in debt, in case you didn't know that. We don't have a God that believes in debt. You may believe in debt, but God wants to give it to you, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. God says you owe no man except the debt to love him or her. That's the only debt we should ever have is the debt to love. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, here's our key scripture. If anyone desires to come after me, let him, what? Deny himself, right? The next thing is what? Take up his cross. And lastly, what? Follow me. That's my three today. First thing I want you to know, he says, deny yourself. Deny yourself. The attitude of denial turns you from self-centered to God-centered. When you deny yourself, that means it's really not about us anymore. And the older I get, the more I find out so much had nothing to do with me. There's so many things you've dealt with and concerned yourself about and you, you preoccupied yourself with and it had nothing really to do with you. Life continues to move on. Whether we stay still or not, life continues to move. 
And it can move with you or it can move without you. But when we start denying ourselves and rather than trying to hold things, let things flow and let them go. Because life continues to move on. He says deny yourself. That means that God is and we're not. When we deny ourselves, we find out that that's a turning point. Whatever you desire, whatever you believe in God for, it starts with you denying yourself. There's a turning point when you say at this point things changed. And the point where things really pivoted, big changes in your life, defining moments when you saw, learned that it wasn't about you. That was in God's hands. When you denied yourself and says, you know, I need to stop pushing against God and let myself, my hands in God's hand, deny myself and let him lead. When we get to that point, that's the defining moment. That's when we denied ourselves. That's when things changed. And if you haven't gotten to that point in your life to where things have really shifted in a major way, it's because you've not denied yourself. You tried to control. You tried to have your pride step in and do it your way. But denying yourself means you learn that it's really not about you. There's things that you want. There's things that God desires for you. What God desires is greater than your desires. More than you could ever ask or imagine, he desires for all of us. But we have to deny ourselves and receive what he has. If I've got a handful of something, I can't receive anything more or anything better. The first thing I got to do is put down what I've got, open my hands, open my heart to receive. We can't receive when we already are full of ourselves and full of other things. When we deny ourselves, we make space for God to move. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. Defining moments happen when we deny ourselves something. Make the naked note. Here's, a, here's another slide for this. It says, you cannot have a resurrection without a crucifixion. You cannot have a resurrection without a crucifixion. In other words, for, for new things to happen, old things have to pass away. That's a revelation for me. You want to hold on to old, but you want new. No, sometimes for old, for old things to, to, to go, it allows new things to come. We can hold on to the old past, the old cities, where you used to, be, used to live. Yeah, this is good. Phoenix is nice, but it's not like it's not Atlanta. Well, it's not Atlanta. It's not Atlanta. You know, it's, it's, it's nice here, but it's not like Flint. I got some Flint folks in the house. <laughs> it's not Flint. Where you are is where God wants you to be. See, there's some things that grows there that can't grow here. There's seasons. I found that down south where I'm from, there are things that I enjoy down south, but they don't grow here. And there's some things that grow here that don't grow there. Sometimes God will allow you to be in a place where you can grow. You say, yeah, but it's not like where it was. Yeah, you've, you've outgrown where you were. You've outgrown that place. Prosper where God plants you. Amen. There's a place where you're meant to take from this point on, assimilate where you are, grow in the environment that you're meant to be in. If you put a, a fish in a small aquarium, a small bowl, they'll only grow to a certain size. But when you transplant them into another and a bigger place, so that they're able to reach their full capacity. But they'll never grow in a certain area. There can't be a crucifixion without a resurrection. The next thing is take up your cross. First thing, deny yourself. Next, take up your cross. Matthew 16, 24, we're just going to stay back where it says, take up your cross and follow him. What is your cross? What is your cross? See, when I began to go to church, I began to go to church because my mother took me to church. Called the drug habit, right? She drugged you to church. First drug habit. Drugged me to church. We went to church. We, anybody track with me on this? We went to church, what, Sunday, Sunday school in the morning, right? After that, we went to our regular church service, which didn't get over until when? Way in the afternoon. And then, was it over? No, it wasn't over. No. You went home, you ate, whatever, and everybody's out playing ball. You had to get dressed and go back to church that evening. Was it over? No. Then at midnight, no. But on Wednesday, we had prayer service. And then Thursday, there was testimony service. And then Saturday, 
you were part of whatever the church was going on. We had, when the church had something going on, and my, my, my mother would always say, I got some volunteers. So we were part of every program, every group, every activity, every play. It was church, church, church. You wondering why I'm where I am now? It's church. That's where we grew up. But I went for my mother. And then as soon as I left my mother's house, I tried to forget. I pretend I forgot. Because we want to do it our way. That's what we tend to want to do it. We get out there. And then I found out that mama was right. Daddy was right. Then I started going to church for me. And I remember coming back to church and just this new relationship with God was so different. I was coming, I was coming because now I wanted to, this relationship. I wanted to know. And that's where some people are. They start going to church because they know that's where they should be. They're going for them now. Not for mama. You're going for you. But then there's another place where you come to church for him. That's what brings you to church now. That's why you can't miss anymore. That's why it's not optional. That's why you'll drive whatever distance you got to go because you're not coming for you anymore. You're not coming for mom anymore. Now you're coming for him. And when you come for the right reason, he shows up every time at church. He will never miss you at church. But if you come for yourself, that means you may come for expectations. Let's see what's going to be like today. Well, it was better last week. Well, I can't, I'm going to be a little late today. No, when you really come and you expect him to be there, he shows up. And where he shows up when, he, when you come to church, he starts showing up in you. He doesn't show up in the praise band. When you come for, with him, he doesn't show up when the pastor starts speaking. He shows up in you. Amen. And there's something about you when he shows up in you that doesn't allow you to be still. You'll have an amen, a shout, a hallelujah. You'll raise your hand. Something in you will allow you to express your love and gratitude to him. Amen. Because he gave us life one more day. Amen. It's not because we're that good. Everything that you've got, thank God for it. So when you come here, you're giving God glory and praise for the things, not just what he's done, but what he's doing and what he's already about to do in your life. Amen. And his plans for you are so good. God has plans for you that are amazing and beyond what you could ever ask or imagine. Take up your cross, he says. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And when Jesus told his disciples that he was going to die, he was, it was through this week. During the week, Jesus told the disciples he's going to die. And Peter would rebuke him. No, Jesus, you're not going to die. That can't happen. And Jesus went to Peter and told Peter that these things must happen. And sometimes people will try to protect you from the discomforts of life. But Jesus let us know that I must die so that everyone else can live and have eternal life. So it wasn't about keeping Jesus around forever. Because sometimes we want to keep things as they are, but God allows things to transition through us so that we can have even better and even more. No one likes to go through the downturn or the difficulties. I heard people talk about losing their job and then getting a much better job. You know, if you hadn't lost that one, you wouldn't have got anything better. But we don't want to go through the point of loss because loss makes us feel like, you know, there's, there's nothing coming in. There's an there's a unfamiliar place when you don't have everything accounted for but God can have a better plan and he often does but it goes through the difficulty guy was asking say how's your brother said my brother lost his job he said that's too bad he said no that's good <laughs> why is that because he found a better job just the next day he found a better job he said that's good he said no that's bad why he said he had to have a cut in pay he said that's too bad he said no that's good because the manager quit and that gave him the job because he was qualified. Now he's making twice as much as he was making on his first job. He says, it's got to be good. He says, no, that's bad. <laughs> because now he's in charge of a territory. He travels a lot. We don't get to see him. He's out. So it's, it's, it's just a stressful time. He said, that's too bad. He said, no, that's good. Because the last time he was out, he met the woman of his dreams. Now they're about to be married. He said, that's good, right? He said, no, that's bad. What am I saying? That can keep going on, but that's our lives, isn't it? We'll have some good days. We'll have some bad days. But we got to know that God allows your good days to outweigh your bad days. 
that no matter what you going through, God has something even greater in store. So we're not going to focus on what is not working right now. We're going to focus on the plans that God has. This may not be working at the moment. But we know this is working for my good and for your good. That, means that you're going to work through this. You're going to give God glory in this, not for this, but in this. This shouldn't change the way you see life. Sometimes people are going through a difficulty and it shows up on their face. They can't even say hi to you because they're going through a stressful time right now. Then some people go through it and they're just as happy. You don't know that they're dealing with what they're going through. They're in treatment. They're going through therapy, but they're still smiling and giving God the glory. That's who we're meant to be. Beacons of light to the world. See, when the world sees things a certain way, we can't see it exactly like the world sees it. When the world's head is down, your head should be up. When the world sees it as dark, we're looking for the light. When the world sees things as being the end, we know that God has a new beginning. That God is a God of promises. And his promises are yea and amen. Whatever God has promised you, his promise is still good. So don't hold on to what isn't. Hold on to the promise that God made you. That God's promise is what you're believing in. That's what revives you to know that God didn't bring you this far just to bring you this far. Why? Because God made you a promise. And you're holding on to God's promises. God's, it's that promise that holds us together. Not circumstances, not your future, not what you have, not what you don't have. It's knowing that God gave you a promise. And you know that God will hold true to his promise. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Take up your cross. The last one God said, uh, Jesus told them, is follow him. Follow him. My God supplies. How many of your needs does God supply? All. All of your needs. you got to believe and know that your God supplies. Even when you're going through distress and heartache, your God is still supplying. When you don't have what you need, you're in a painful situation, God supplies. We can have hope in him because God always supplies your needs. He says he'll never leave you and he will never forsake you. That means no matter where you are, God is supplying something to you. And the thing about what God supplies is you don't always see it in the natural. Sometimes God's preparing something for you in the spirit. And as you go into the spirit of God, as you're praying and believing in God, God reveals to you in that prayer time, in that time with him, God reveals to you a glimpse of what he has for you. That's why they say weeping endures through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Because somewhere in that midnight hour, somewhere you're pouring out your heart to God, somewhere while you're in your sanctuary, when you're believing God for it and you're praying, suddenly God gives you a glimmer of hope. And when that resolves in your spirit, suddenly you know everything's going to be all right. Nothing has changed in your natural, but in your spirit, you know that God's already given you the revelation that you need. That this situation didn't come to stay, it already came to pass. So that's why you can rejoice about it. People, why are you so happy about it? Because I've got the revelation from God. God told me that everything's going to be all right. You know, grandmothers used to know about that because when they would go into the hospital, the doctors would tell them about this and say, Doc, do what you're going to do because I already had my talk with Jesus. And Jesus told me that everything's going to be all right. So I won't, I won't let you do what you got to do, but I already got the word right now. And when we've got the promise from God, when he's already made you a promise, then you can rest on sheets of satisfaction. And sleep on pillows of peace because he made you a promise. Everything's going to be all right. And we talk about the resurrection. When, when, when Jesus hung his head and died, they, they thought it was over. I love this, what this little girl was talking about. Wasn't that beautiful what she talked about? That they thought it was done. Satan thought that he had won. But, you know, Jesus was just at the beginning of defeating death for you and I. He went down into hell and defeated Satan, took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He says, death, where is your stain? Grave, where is your victory? And he came back to you and I so that we might have a right to the eternal life. But you don't know the death and what that really means for us. That while we were out there, while we were sinning, Jesus was dying on that cross and asking God to forgive not only them, but forgive you and I. Because our sins are many. But Jesus hung all of those sins on that cross. When you accept him as your Lord and Savior and you receive him, all of your sins are washed away and you are forgiven. That's the good news about it. That's what the resurrection means. 
It means that we can look and see that there's an empty cross. We don't serve Jesus on the cross. Yes, some, some religions will have Jesus on the cross. The cross is empty. He's not there because he got up. I said he got up. That makes a difference. He got up, right? He got up. Because he got up, whatever you're in, whatever you're facing, you can get up as well. Nothing has a hold of you. You have all the power and authority. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in every one of us. He's telling you, get up. Get up. Wherever you are, get up. It's not over. He gives you the authority to use his name at the name of Jesus. At that name, every knee shall bow. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name of Jesus. My grandmother used to rock and just say Jesus. Just rock and just saying Jesus. Just every time you mention the name of Jesus, Jesus shows up. When you call upon him, he's right there. He's an on-time God. Just never neglect it. Always know that he's just right there. Call on the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to share with those who are going to be baptized in a moment. I'll share a little bit about that. Baptism, the application of baptism is when in the Old Testament, anyone who want to be a, a Jew, would want to be, uh, accept the Jewish faith, would be baptized as a cleansing ritual. It was a purifying. It was one of the rites that you go through. But when Jesus came, John the Baptist was baptized for remission of sins, for repentance. He said, there's one coming after me that will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That's a greater baptism we're talking about. And then it says that in Acts, it says, repent every one of us and be baptized in the name of Jesus. So he gives us the command to not just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but be baptized. Repent. And in Acts, I'm going to just stress off in Acts chapter 8, verse 27. This is when an Ethiopian eunuch with great authority was riding in his chariot. And then Philip, one of the apostles, came to him and asked him, do you know what you're reading? And the eunuch said, I do not know unless someone explains to me what I'm reading. He was reading the scripture. And he was reading about the prophecy of Jesus coming. And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning of the scripture preached Jesus to him. Now as he went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. See, that's the only qualification. Jesus, uh, Philip had just met this eunuch. He didn't say, okay, you got to go through some baptism classes. Okay, you got to accept Jesus. Then you got to attend our church. You got to join our church. He spoke Jesus to him. He says, I received Jesus with all of my heart. And then the eunuch said, but here's some water. Can I get, can I get baptized now? And, Jesus, and Philip says, yes. And then the scripture says, he believed that Jesus went all of his heart, so he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. I mentioned before, if you were baptized before, you may be baptized as a child, or maybe you didn't understand what you were doing when you were baptized. And now that you've made a full confession, you understand your sins. You said, I, I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. I believe it. I, I give my, le my life to him. I confess him. If you've been baptized before, you could be baptized again under this, under this anointing. Under this confession, you could be baptized again. Doesn't mean you get baptized every week. But once you've made the confession, you understand who he is, you confess your sins, you can be baptized. Almighty God, we... We come together as the body of Christ, the body of believers. We stand with the acknowledgement that you have come, you, you bled for us, you shed your blood, and you rose today. We celebrate that. But we celebrate those that are coming to be baptized today. What an awesome opportunity and a privilege to, to surrender their lives to Jesus, to accept him as Lord and Savior. We ask that you would anoint this time together that we share. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. The church said.